Hi, so I'm Jessica Meiselman. I am the general counsel at OpenFin, and I'm joined today with Erica Marquez Avitia. Erica is the chief operating officer at Old Mission. Uh, Anthony Tassone, who is the founder and chief executive officer of Green Key Technologies, and Jackie McGuire, who is a senior director and talent advisory at Greenhouse, a hiring software company. So today we're going to talk about hiring and acquiring talent, with a specific emphasis on COVID and, and remote remote hiring. Um, Anthony, when we spoke before the session, you had an interesting uh, process that you guys follow at, at your company. And you even shared that you had some uh, posts on Glassdoor of people who did not get a job at your company, but were still, um, you know, very, uh, you know, praising your, your process. So I, I think it'd be interesting to hear from you. Uh, and then we'll toss it over to the other panelists to talk about how generally they hire, what their process is like, and what they focus on during interviews. Anthony, do you want to kick it off? Yes, happy to. Thanks, Jessica, for having me. And uh, thanks for OpenFin for, for inviting me here. Uh, how is my audio and video? Is it okay, Jessica? Yeah, you're all good. Okay, perfect. So um, I think it's important to start with, you know, the hiring process. It starts with a clear consensus among maybe your management team that there's an urgent need for this role. Sometimes we're super quick to throw bodies at a problem. And I think that your default position should be skeptical of needing a new hire. And you want to try to solve problems with better processes first. The, the worst thing you can do is to hire people who are not urgently needed. And then you, you have too much productivity slack in the organization. So with that said, so now you've decided to hire, now what? Well, hiring is not free. It's very expensive. It consumes a lot of everyone's time and hard work. And it's also not riskless. It's actually full of risk. You can hurt your culture and your employee morale by doing it poorly. So you really wanna to communicate to your team why are you interviewing for this role? And then you want to run an interview process that's objective, it's structured in a way, much like managing a product roadmap. And when you're this thoughtful about your process, you're, you're actually signaling to your existing team, we are a high caliber team and I'm going to protect us by only allowing other high performance people into this organization. So I'm a huge advocate for systematic interviews uh, because I think having a method allows you to record and measure and improve over time. And uh, it also, it gives candidates more transparency and it reduces their anxiety. And don't forget like, you know, in interviewing is stressful for the candidate. They're extremely vulnerable and they're being judged. So there's two unique things I think your audience could probably learn from, from Grinky. And, and by the way, we're not perfect and, and we're always improving and we've not always been good at interviewing and hiring. Uh, I was actually quite poor as a, as a young CEO. We've gotten better over time. But there's two unique things I'd like to share. One is that we're very proactive and we target people. So we run email sequencing. We're responsible for top of funnel. We think like a recruiter in targeting specific people and specific roles. And then number two, we run an interview process that's principled and based around cultural fitness. So we care how will you do your job first and then if you can do the job second. And in order to run a cultural assessment, you really need to define and rank cultural principles. These are behaviors that you encourage and reward. So at Green Key, things like directness and optimism and curiosity and resiliency, these are the things we sat down and said, these are most important to us. And then once you define those principles, you can create a set of questions to ask, like, are you a lucky person? How did you make money in high school? Are you a busy person? Um, and so, you know, defining your cultural process is the very first thing you need to do in order to run a systematic interview process. Uh, and then lastly, I would say digitize as much as possible through the application process and surveys. You're collecting data prior to Zoom videos. You're, you're basically using the data to conduct interviews and you're going to try to standardize questions and your feedback so that your process is not subjective. So by the time you get to live interviews, you've already assessed, is this person a cultural fit? And now you're doing more of an aptitude test uh, and filtering for ego and other, other uh, negative cultural uh, uh, principles. Got it, so you have a big fo focus on culture, it sounds like, um, which sort of leads into another question. Um, do you think that, you know, I think for us, one of the important things we would do with, with various candidates is walk them through our office, introduce them to people, have them meet different people from different departments. 
Um, that gave, gave us an opportunity to sort of showcase our culture and share things about the company that we thought, you know, look, are, are looked upon as benefits by potential candidates. Um, Jackie and Erica, do you think that you found solutions to, to bridge that gap in a virtual world where you find a way to share your culture through, you know, a Zoom interview or something else? Yeah, well, uh, also I wanna um, thank you for having us here today. This is such an awesome conversation. And I have to start by saying I couldn't agree more with what Anthony's saying regarding um, structured hiring practices and adding that um, structure and diligence up front to make sure that, that you're putting in the work up front to create a clear process and then following it um, in order to have a more objective process and reduce bias. And I think that actually leads um, really closely with what you're asking, because largely what we've found is that um, when we moved virtual, um, I agree, it can be hard to convey certain aspects of your culture through your interview process, right? The example you gave, if you're not in the office and seeing the space, you're not able to see people collaborating in the open office setting, right? Like that's something that's missing. But if you really think about it, the culture is your people, the culture is in your talent and the talent that's working at your team and they're still gonna be a part of the process. So if you differentiate sort of the, the perks of the office with the true values that are in your culture and then create a structured process to assess for those values and also train your team to speak about those values, you're able to convey your culture in a potentially more meaningful way than just by seeing it in the space. You're actually training people to speak about it, ask questions about it, assess for it in a, in a really intentional way. So I think that there's um, actually an opportunity in, in adding your culture intentionally into your interview process through the people who hold it, right? Through, through your talent, through your employees. Yeah, and another thing you just touched on that I think we should dive in a little bit more to because we had an interesting conversation around this a couple of days ago is the ability to reduce bias in interviews um, on Zoom. I think you brought up a couple interesting points when we chatted last week uh, about you know, how a Zoom interview levels the playing field a little bit. Could you share a little bit about that and your thoughts there? Yeah, um, I definitely can. So, and I should give the context that at Greenhouse, um, we are in um, our whole world is reducing bias in hiring through structured hiring. So that's gonna be sort of the lens that I, I come through. Um, but there is a way to use our new virtual environment um, to be more inclusive to um, employees. So we're at a time um, where I think that having extra empathy with our candidates and with our internal teams and hiring managers is incredibly important, right? Like there is an extra level of non-work related stress on I would argue just about everyone these days. Um, and so we can now take our virtual world and give people um, more flexibility in their interview schedules. It may be easier to schedule at off times um, when we're all working from home. And you can ask your candidates these things, you can ask your interviewers these things and create a, a system that still follows the structured process, that's still competency driven, that's still focused on hiring people for their ability to do the job, but doing it in a way that focuses on each individual's experience and having a more inclusive process um, given the world that we're in. Um, you can give people a little bit of early access to the different tools that they'll be using, right? One of the processes that we put into place was just creating a simple one pager um, for our interviewers, um, for our candidates rather, that tells them which tools we'll be using, whether it's Zoom or a different remote coding platform and all of those systems and say, make yourself familiar before you come in on day one. Um, or before you come in to that interview. Um, and it helps to uh, just open up the door to more people. Yeah, that's great. Erica, I wanna bring you into the conversation. Um, is there anything that you found that your hiring or interviewing processes have needed to accommodate for in COVID-19? Obviously, you know, being all virtual is, is a benefit to some and, a, and, a, and also a negative to some. Um, do you have any comments on, on things you guys have found uh, helpful or less helpful during the last few months? I think what we have found is that we need to do more talking. As we talked to our candidates, we found that a lot of them, and we're in a hot competition, right, for some of the best uh, developers in the world here at Old Mission. 
And quite honestly, what we have found is that people, candidates miss talking to humans, right? Everything is all automated or there's like a, a email that's generated because you submitted, you know, your application. Our recruiters actually get on the phone. I get on the phone and talk with our candidates and talk them through the process of what to expect, who's going to be on Zoom. Hey, this is a lineup of interviewers and this is why. So what we have found is that to a certain extent, over communicating over phone has become what people really enjoy about Ole Mission and more of that personal experience as part of the interview. Got it. Anthony, do you think you've had to accommodate anything specific or do you feel like your process really fit well into the virtual environment? Um, I, yeah, I don't think we've made any, any major changes with, um, with Zoom uh, at all. Um, I, I just wanna go back and, and uh, echo some of the things we're talking about. You know, culture is not what we say, it's what we do. And uh, so to the extent that you can show them what you do, I think maybe it's been a little bit harder in a remote world to show them your colleagues, uh, but you can show them how you value their time. You can be super transparent and organized and have good communication discipline and say, this is part of our culture. We value your time. We value agendas. We value meeting summaries and notes going out after the meeting. We value explaining to you what stage you're at in the process. So I think you can demonstrate your culture over Zoom, uh, but it's, it's certainly a little bit harder. And uh, in terms of my role as, as CEO of Greenkey, I'm not doing um, proficiency assessments or aptitude tests. You know, my, my team handles that, the engineers and data scientists. I'm essentially uh, assessing cultural fit and explaining and answering questions around career trajectory. And most importantly, exciting them on the problem they will work on, because that's ultimately what people want, is they want good culture and a good problem to work on with some career trajectory. And so uh, I don't think Zoom has, has changed my ability to do that. That's great. And I think uh, something that I also found interesting about your the other things you shared with me is the baseball card um, idea that you have with, with aptitude. And it shares you know, what people's emotional strengths and weaknesses are and then helps other co colleagues learn how to best work with their new colleagues. Could you share a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah. So we, we use a company called Predictive Index. And actually, that's a, that's a software tool that we use after somebody's been hired. And what that does is create metrics around your communication style. Um, and so I, I always share that up front with candidates because, um, you know, a really good trick is you want to be super vulnerable with people. You don't have a lot of time to waste. So you want to say, like, you know, no bullshit. Uh, I really need, like, honest, transparent, direct answers. And the way you're going to get that is for you to open up and for you to be super vulnerable to them in, in the first five or 10 minutes. So a lot of times I'll give people that information about me prior to the meeting so they can get a sense of who I am and how I think and what I'm like. I'll often share personal stories about my childhood or, or family or about my goals or my weaknesses in the first five or 10 minutes just to soften up that experience and really get that person to be more trusting and open so we can get to uh, you know, the, the meat of the meeting a little bit faster than, than would be normal. So that baseball card that you're referring to, it's um, predictive index and it's something that, uh, I think I wrote a blog about it a couple of years ago for them. You can Google predictive index in my name and that will come up. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's been really productive and effective for us. And, and just one last comment, uh, I've never seen a situation where it wasn't accurate. A lot of people are nervous and scared about that when they take tests and click buttons and go, well, my personality is way too complex for some thing to be able to assess me accurately. Uh, the, the reality is that they're pretty close. And I've never seen one where any of our employees or our management team have come back and go, I don't know who that person is that's so far from me. Uh, I've have had like almost 99% uh, success rate in terms of somebody saying, I took that test and yes, this is how I communicate. And uh, this is an accurate description of myself. Got it. So in terms of retaining talent, um, obviously, you know, in-person gatherings are limited and, and you, you've all sort of identified that culture um, and environment is a big, important part of your workforce. What have you done with your employees in terms of socialization opportunities or other sort of remote opportunities to you know keep people engaged and keep people excited about working at your companies during the last six months? 
I can take this one, Jessica. Uh, so what we started doing right at the beginning of the pandemic is what we called Family Meal Mondays, where we would give our employees vouchers for Uber Eats. Um, and we would all get together at 7 p.m. online and have some sort of, whether it be a comedy show or an employee showing off how to make a souffle, um, just something that brought us together, given that we were all separated and working from home um, and some were still in the office. So it really brought us together. And we actually continue that program through today because not all of our workforce is back in the office. So it's just giving people chances to get together in a virtual format. And, um, you know, some of us may be suffering from Zoom fatigue and we recognize it. So we're not doing that necessarily as often as we did at the beginning, uh, but we're still very much trying to say like, hey, let's do some cookie decorating for, uh, you know, Halloween or we'll have a comedian coming up next month, something to bring us together. Cool. Jackie, Anthony, anything to add? Anything you guys have done? Yeah, I'm happy to add to that. Um, so I, the, the appetite at Green Key is always, um, there's a lot of demand for information and community and to celebrate wins. And so uh, we do quarterly uh, sort of like a, a light board meeting to the, to the company internally, just explaining what, where, what's happening within the organization. Uh, in terms of community, we've done virtual drinks. We did that a couple of weeks ago. That, that's a successful event to have a mixologist come on and, and make drinks with people and to give people that community-like experience. And uh, we, we, every week we celebrate wins. Our COO will send out a weekly uh, win email. And I think that's it's super important uh, because my one tip I have for the audience is that employees, I'm somebody, you know, we give equity and salary uh, uh, to, to employees. That's not why people do their job every day. What, what happens is uh, people don't want to let other people down. That's the type of organization that you're building. It ultimately comes down to everybody's working really hard because they don't want to let each other down. That's the type of organization that you want to build. And uh, so in order to foster that, you want to celebrate wins and create that type of culture where, uh, you know, you've got a foxhole mentality and people are really working hard because they don't want to let anybody else down. I, I agree. And I, to add to your, um, your question, Jessica, about different uh, ways to keep employees engaged, Something that we found um, similar to what we were speaking about from a hiring perspective, um, the foundations of what keep people engaged hasn't changed. The foundations of what makes great hiring and interviewing hasn't changed, right? It's still like that structured hiring. It's still about engaging employees through meaningful work. It's just the ways that we do it had to be tweaked a little bit, right? Um, and so for us, what we found um, with our employee engagement was having different, uh, sort of a diversity of different options um, to accommodate different ways that people engage with the organization. So we let some of our employees really shine with their different expertise outside of work, having employees lead yoga sessions that were optional. Um, but it creates that sense of community. Um, and then making sure that some of the um, employee engagement opportunities were work-related and celebrating work wins. Others were more social, like um, having different classes. Last week, we did a, a really great, there's escape the room um, that you could do, but it's escape the Zoom. Um, so we found some fun things that were non-work-related mixed in with some more engaging work-related ways to celebrate people's wins. And then also making sure that they were happening on both the company level, the department level, and the team level. So enabling managers to have the tools they needed to know that they could schedule these different types of sessions so that regardless of where the employee is or how they engage with the company, we made sure there were options so that we could make sure that there were lots of different ways to accommodate different people's ways of engaging. Got it. And has anyone planned anything special for in lieu of a in-person holiday party this year? We have not yet. yet. I don't Maybe know really. <laughs> if anybody has planned a holiday party at Greenhouse yet. They haven't told me. I'm not sure what <laughs> we're doing. I should say that we typically do our holiday celebrations in January because it uh, can be a little bit stressful on certain teams who are trying to close out the year to, to have all the parties and events in December. So we've always done ours in January. So we're a little bit far out from, from our holiday celebrations. Great. Yeah, we've been performing over at Ole Mission as to what to do. And quite honestly, we've had some tremendous growth and a lot of people have never even seen each other. Um, so we're planning a speed networking event um, just to get the seasoned people meeting the new people. And 
trying to make up for it, but quite honestly, we just don't think it's, it's worth it to try to gather a bunch of people in one room right now. So we're gonna do our best to, to kind of keep it mingle, you know, keep us mingling with one, one, one another. Yeah. Anthony, anything you wanted to add? I, I'm, I'm told uh, that we're going to do the virtual drink session again, that it was a huge success. And, and you know, essentially it's a Chicago based uh, mixologist and they send kits out to everybody's house. And the oh, only cool. thing you provide is the bourbon or tequila or vodka. And, uh, and so I know that that's part of the holiday uh, event, but uh, I, I need to go and ask some questions and figure out what else we're doing. <laughs> Very cool. Um, so, I mean, I think we can probably close out. What, what I'm really hearing from all of these questions or all of these comments are that we're leaning on technology a lot here. Um, do you have any closing advice with respect to how you lean on technology, other advice outside of technology that you think is meaningful to, to you and your process during this time? Um, we can start with Jackie and then I'll, I'll move through everyone. Yeah, for sure. I think what my main piece of advice right now would be is look for areas of opportunity. We're in a challenging time right now where we have to change some of our processes and there are some uh, new challenges that are coming uh, from work. There's plenty of new challenges coming from our outside of work life. Um, but look at some of the improvements that you can make. There's opportunities to reduce your time to hire because you're able to be more flexible with scheduling. There's opportunities to be more inclusive in your interviewing practices um, and maybe create better systems for creating feedback because we're not face-to-face. -face. And once you adapt these new processes, don't lose them when we're back in office. Track what you're doing, track the improvements that you're making and make them long-term improvements. They don't have to be short-term just for the time that we're virtual. I think that's great advice. Anthony? Um, I, I probably would just reemphasize uh, what I said earlier, which is like really sit down and think about what are your cultural principles. I, you know, I mentioned Green Kiwi of Seven. And I have an acronym Doc Wessi D O C W S I that I think about when I interview people, and the D is directness or compassionate candidness. And we'll just focus on that that first one. Uh, that means everything to us. You know, we're trying to build an organization where you surface bad ideas and you replace them with good ideas. And there's no ego and you just run through that process. And, uh, and so that's important for us to test for. A lot of times we'll interview data scientists who are super smart, but a bit shy. And sometimes we'll interview salespeople who are very direct and candid, but they're not, they don't do it compassionately. And so you really wanna to try to find people who are compassionately candid about their ideas. And um, the other thing is culture is not just, you know, a silly buzzword. It's, it really is, it's leverage in your organization. It's things that people actually buy your culture before they buy your product. It makes interviewing tremendously easier when you've got great culture. It's the thing that attracts people to you. It'll make your hiring process go a lot smoother and easier. And it all starts with defining your cultural principles. What are the things we wanna encourage and, uh, and, and the behaviors that we want to enforce. And then one last trick for hiring, and I learned this um, you know, later on in the process, I really like to interview uh, or ask questions of former colleagues. I don't ask people for their references. Uh, maybe this is a CEO thing, I'm not sure. My team leaves this up to me because I can get access to these people. But the best information you're gonna get about somebody is from their former colleagues. And you, you know, one person is just a data point, but if you're getting the same data from three or four different people, uh, you know, then you can form a thesis. And so I really, you know, at Green Key, we do not hire anybody who doesn't, who we don't go through former uh, references. You're just not gonna join Green Key unless we speak to people you've actually worked with in the past. Uh, and I like to speak with them because they're way more candid on the phone. I have a whole process for getting that information. I don't even tell them your name. I just contact people, email, or I'll text you. And uh, people are nosy. They just want to know. You know they, they'll ask, hey, who's this about? And I'll say, I can't tell you. Can we get on the phone? Because if you tell them the name and the reaction is negative, you're never going to hear from them again. So you want to get them on the phone. And then you want to say, hey, you worked with so-and-so in the past. I'm on the fence about them. Can you tell me some information? The most valuable info you will get through the hiring process is at that reference stage. Uh, and that, that sort of, um, anyway, that's a tip that we learned later on in the process that I think is very useful. 
as a lawyer in the room, I, I think I'm obliged to tell you to check with your counsel before yeah. you do something like that. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, Erica, any, any parting words? Yeah, parting words, I think that, you know, in Old Mission, one of the things that we really focus on is saying like, hey, we're looking for a good fit for our firm, right? We keep talking about culture on this, uh, on this conversation, but we want to make sure it's also a good fit for you. So really what we strive is, you know, when we put our recruiter hats on is to say like, what's important to you? And we really want to get to that, that meat of um, what's at the heart of like, why are you looking? What are you looking for in your next role? And job wise, project wise, and then even what you would expect from a management team. So it's really to have that clear communication with your recruiter, whoever it is that your touch point is, so that we as recruiters and, and the hiring side can really get a good feel for what you're looking for and then be able to tell you honestly, do I have it or not? You know, I pride myself at Old Mission in having, you know, the one day check-in and 30 day check-ins where I'm like, do you feel like you got what we sold you? Um, because my job is to go out there and find really good talent, but it's also my job to keep you here and to make sure you're happy and you're challenged. So um, as, as an individual looking for a new role to really think through what's important to you, um, I can sell you this great big, uh, great big um, story, but it's more of like, hey, do you think this is going to be a good fit for you? And then force me to tell you more about what I have to offer you. I have, I have just to add to Erica's point, because I know Erica uh, hires a lot of engineers and technical folks. In my experience, those people, they really appreciate communication discipline. They do not want to be in meetings all day. And it's, it's one of the things that Green Key uses to attract people is that we're like a no meetings culture. We, we really emphasize, don't set up meetings just to have meetings. Try to solve problems over email and, uh, and, and try to limit the exposure you have to meetings. We really do view meetings as lazy and bad and should be only used to discuss gaps that can't be solved in email. And the engineering types really appreciate that. Okay, well, that wraps up our panel. Thank you so much for joining us.